So, Dwight, let's, um, let's start by looking at the sort of major changes that have happened in the, the database market. I mean, you know, for a long time, it really wasn't much. It was SQL was the game. Um, what brought about the sort of shift that created the opportunity for Mongo? I, th I think a couple of things. First of all, I think there's a lot of new needs that weren't there before. You know, people want, there's, there's this imperative to scale. They need big, big data. They want to, and they want to be able to scale horizontally, not big mainframes, but lots of machines, more cloud-style scaling. Right. There's a big need for that. There's a need to be able to deal with the, the kind of data we build applications out of the day, which has uh, changed a lot. You know, it's not all rows and columns. A lot of semi-structured data, unstructured data, polymorphic data, so uh, knowledge worker data. So we need ways to deal with that. We need tools that work well with the way we write code today, which is, you know, we use agile development methods. Is the database, does it elegantly fit into those methodologies? And, and the older databases don't because they're older than these methodologies, which were invented later. So that was the need. And then, but then there's a second aspect, I think, to the question or the answer with, yeah. of, well, why now? Or why, why did it not change for so long, for 30 years right. or something? Right. Uh, you know, the first papers on relational were like 1970. It's like the Rolling uh, Stones, yeah, yeah. you know, so, every decade. And, you think they're going to disappear, but they're still there. So the other half of the answer is because uh, nobody had a new, better, total solution. And, and, and I'm not claiming that we, Mongo, do, but I think the, the, the industry does now, which is we, we've actually came up with an approach that solves these new problems, but in a way that gives you enough that you didn't lose so much that you didn't want it. Because we, we talked, you know, there was a time when ob object-oriented sort of stuff was going to be, that was all the rage. This was going to be the big takeover. And then it didn't happen. Right. Is the same thing, is there a risk the same thing will happen again? Right. Or is it so different? So we've seen, you know, we've seen like in the past, like in the 80s, object databases were, you know, they, they were very trendy for a little bit. And then in the 90s, XML databases. Yeah. And, and, but nothing really stuck, right? And, and so why now, why is this? And, and clearly this is, I mean, the scale of usage is huge. Um, both of all the products and even MongoDB by itself, it's it, it's so far beyond what we saw back then with like the object databases. Can you just it, give us a couple of stats? It's, it's among clear them. you're kind of over that kind of chasm there. Oh, if you give will. us an example. I mean, well, the nine million downloads. downloads. Nine million uh, already. Wow. So, it, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and just you know, tens of thousands of organizations using it for something. Right. Uh, you know, um, and and. and and a lot of products in the space that are all quite popular. Mo MongoDB is, is the most popular of these quote unquote NoSQL products, which the space tends to be called, but, but a lot of successful products. So there seems to be a real sector there. Okay, and, and just in case there are people in the room who don't really you know, understand the difference between SQL, NoSQL, could, could you just lay out the sort of fundamental differences? Yeah, so this, this term NoSQL was coined <laughs> by someone not me. Uh, back around 2009, and as a way to talk about these new data stores, right? And but but it, it's a bit imprecise because it's first of all it's a it's saying it's a negative, right? Not SQL, but it's really not about the query language. It's more about the, the really these next generation horizontally scalable databases that happen to be non-relational, that happen to work really well with the kinds of data we use these days. That's what they really are. And, but, but that's the moniker we have to work with for the moment. Right. Uh, so, and I would, if you, just to talk a little bit more about monikers, you know, people talk about big data. Yes. And I, I feel like there's two big buckets under that. One's NoSQL, the other's Hadoop. Hadoop being this distributed, distributed, pro, uh, distributed, distributed processing fabric. system, computational yeah. fabric, yeah. more for BI, data science. This is more to be a database, operational data stores. Right. For building I, applications. I, I've seen it crudely sort of juxtaposed as, you know, SQL, it's sort of like your Excel spreadsheet with, say, and whereas with um, your kind of offerings, let's not call them most SQL, but the new generation, it's more sort of document oriented. Is that a, a fair sort of? Yeah, so in MongoDB and, and I think in, in half of these new products, the data model is a, what we call a document oriented data model. So by that we don't mean Word documents. Literally documents. We mean yeah. kind of like we mean JSON documents specifically. Got it. Right. So these documents have structure to them, but they also have a good deal of flexibility to them, and they can be very rich. Got it. Uh, you know, not all the products though are document oriented. You know, some of them are key value stores. Some of them are 
more like a big table data model, which we, people call Columnar. Uh, so there, it, there's an interesting question is, is sort of, okay, it's not relational uh, in part because we want to build very large clusters sometimes and distributed joins is a really hard problem. So what is the data model? So our position was this document-oriented data model is, is the way to go. Got it. I, I've seen um, a gentleman called Michael Stonebreaker say, you know, uh, he's a, a database uh, academic expert, and he says, my, you know, my prediction is that NoSQL will come to mean not yet SQL. Um, you know, it, he said, Cassandra and Mongo have announced what looks like, unless you squint, a really high-level language that's basically SQL. Is that, uh, it's confusing, right? I mean, is that true, false? Well, so MongoDB from day one had a, an ad hoc query language, right? You know, it's a database, you know. You can do ad hoc queries, you can create indexes, you could sort, you know, insert, update, delete, you know. Uh, uh, a lot of the things you would expect from a database that we do. So it was really us just thinking about as developers going back to like seven years ago. It's like, well, what do we need and what do we really want? And it's like, well, I'd kind of like to have something like MySQL but I wanted to be able to scale out, and I wanted to work easily with the programming languages I'm using these days, which are all object-oriented. And, 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 and that's sort of how we ended up where we did. So we didn't throw out everything. Uh, you know, we, we left out joins because distributed joins with full generality on large clusters is a very, very hard problem to right. make right. highly performant. Right? Not, we like them. It's just, it's, 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 uh, the, it's an unsolved problem with full generality. Uh, and, and likewise, uh, distributed transactions on a thousand server cluster with, with no simplifying assumptions is also, and high speed is also a very hard unsolved right. problem. Right. So what we did is we just had these little mini micros transactions instead solely, but, but we kind of put it in a form where you could actually get really far with it because you know, a lot of times I can have rich embedded documents. Wow. Instead of doing so, joins and get the same result with no extra work, for example. I see. Yeah, so, uh, so it didn't get you there every time, uh, but, but it's sort of like an 80-20 thing. It's, it's like kind of keeping 80% of the goodness and then getting these new capabilities. Got it. And, and where have you seen take up fastest for this new sort of approach? Who, who really loves the data? Who are the early adopters? Customer that, that, that's an interesting question now looking back because it's, it's getting to be kind of mainstream now. Which is good, right? right? Yeah, but, yeah. but in the so, early days, uh, what did it... I, I mean, startups were early adopters, uh, and then it was really by industry, right? So there's, I, I think, the tech industry, uh, like if you talk about like Fortune 500 type companies, right. they were early adopters. You know, you know, uh, uh, and uh, actually, government was a semi-early adopter. Government? Yeah. Both, Seriously? Yeah, both local, ah. national, like, okay. I, like city of Chicago, you know, using the product and, wow. and, and the geospatial features, uh, example, but, uh, and, and then over time, well, more and more industries so where so we've got like you, you've got tiny com you know two person companies very common for them to use MongoDB, but also a good number a, a lot probably most of the ten biggest companies in the world use it for something. Wow, and and you, you're open source, and and, and you've. Yeah, the hardest thing though is it's sort of developing the community. The challenge is to develop the community of developers and also the community of users. Could you talk about, I know you've got something called MongoDB University, which obviously you're the dean of. <laughs> so how, how is it like being a dean? And how have you gone about setting this, this up? So that has been very interesting and incredibly successful because we've had uh, I don't know if at this point if it's two or 300,000 enrollments in classes. These classes are, they're, they're multi-user online open courses like Audacity, Coursera, Stanford online courses, wow. right? So we were looking at all those things and said, hey, this makes a lot of sense and a lot of people want to learn how to use MongoDB. So we make courses, we made MongoDB for developers, M101, MongoDB for DBAs, M102. And then we've made further courses since then, like advanced ones. But these are seven week long courses, a couple hours of video lectures per week quizzes every week, homework every week, which is graded autom through an automated system, and then a final at the end, which is graded. Wow. So you can pass or fail, uh, you know, and it, it works very much like all the other uh, MOOC stuff out there, you know, same kind of model, but that hasn't been done too much in the sort no. of enterprise B2B space. I've it's never been more like in the, it works so well. Just um, the, the number of people taking these courses, is, it's, it's incredible, because it's not like watching a video for an hour. 
you've signed up, and the completion rates are not 100%, they're similar to Coursera and all those other things, but, uh, but it's, uh, are they the paid numbers for? are Do I have huge. to pay for them, or are they free? It's free. Free, fantastic. So Dean Dwight makes education free for the masses. That is, that's a wonderful thing. And you said sort of 300,000 are through this? So on the developer's side, is there anything else you've done? Obviously, the developers use these, but what else have you done to sort of really engage the community? Uh, uh, just a lot of, in the early days, a lot of outreach, a lot of going to conferences, meetups in you know, cities everywhere talking about this stuff. Uh, it was crucial. You know, really also just focused on free user product success. You know, if you're having a problem, can, can we make it work? In the early days, that was, those were the biggest factors. Got it. And, and if I am, I'm right, your growth has been largely organic. Um, but you did an acquisition at the end of last year, a company called Wired Tiger. What, what was all that about and why? Yeah, so that was the first acquisition I think we've done. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, our focus right now with the product, you know, it's gotten really popular. So what, what is the highest priority for us right now like in the, develop, in the development pipeline? It's really about making sure people are confident they can use it to build mission critical apps, right? And so it's really product maturity, you know, capability, concurrency, uh, things like this. So the, the right. 3.0 release, which is the latest release, what we did in there is uh, we developed, uh, we put in a new architecture for pluggable storage engines, which, for example, MySQL has that. Right. right. There's different storage engines for MySQL, like NoDB and, uh, and so, MySAM and so forth. So we, we, that release, that was new for us. And, you know, we started working on some different things then. But the idea was if, if I give you this facility where you can plug in an engine that really does what you need and maybe is really powerful from anyone, that that would be really powerful. Then what happened is we started talking to the folks at Wired Tiger, and we thought, well, gee, this would make a really great storage engine to plug in. It has all these great features, you know, super granular concurrency, uh, very high performance. Uh, and so it was a great fit. So, so we, we did that, and, and that's, it's, it's integrated, and it's bundled in the 3.0 release. It's, uh, we left the default, the legacy engine, so you just got to put on the command line to ask for the other one. Got it. But that will change, I think. Uh, and so that uh, accelerated your yeah, progression so, in those yeah, areas. Yeah, right? but you it was done that very yourself. much because we're focusing right now on just that you know, sort of making it more mission critical uh, or mature. Got it. And um, y y you face a couple of very large competitors in the... From the legacy side, let's call them, um, you know, in Oracle with uh, MySQL and uh, um, with Microsoft in MySQL Server, are, are they going to disappear eventually? Are they, are they destined for death, or is, is this going to be like a sort of sedimentation thing where they sink to the bottom and you and others sort of rise on top? Yeah. So the way I would, so my prediction there with what's going to happen with databases is, so first of all, I'll make two buckets. I'll say, you know, online and offline. Right. right. So if, you want to, if we want to talk about business intelligence and reporting and that in data warehouses, I'm a little bit less sure how that's going to evolve. So I'm just going to set that aside for a second. But on the okay. other side, where you're building an app, writing an application, you need a backing database or data store. Right. I think what's going to happen is already happening is that in the future, the majority of those, the backing store, will be one of these new NoSQL databases. A mi only a minority would be relational. So there'll still be some minority of use cases where they are the best solution. You know, maybe like accounting. Yes. Where the where yeah. real world data is rows and columns. Right. Right. But I think so that's the exception directly. to the rule. You know, most of the problems we work on these days, you know, mobile Internet of Things, you know, uh, uh, pulling together disparate data, groupware, knowledge worker. Making yes. It, it's, it's, it's a little bit softer. And I think on average, the use case is more towards, fits better with the NoSQL stuff. So I think it'll be majority of new apps we build them with the NoSQL. So it, it will be, for the most part, it'll just become a legacy technology. But it takes a long time for legacy technologies to become really legacy, you know, because there's a lot of code out there, and it doesn't this disappear. <laughs> and if I'm the CIO, Remarkably. If, if, if this app is if right. it's not strategic at the moment, it works perfectly, I'm not going to touch it. Got it. Perfect. OK. Um, you know, you're a serial entrepreneur. And this conference has a lot of entrepreneurs, no doubt, sitting in the audience here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey from DoubleClick to Mongo? You know, what, what sort of drove you to continue doing this? And why pick databases, of, of all things, when you've been in the ad business? Yeah, so, so I was at 
I helped start DoubleClick and was CTO there for the first 10 years. And, 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 and so with MongoDB, it was, and with my co-founders, we were kind of trying to create what we wished we'd had then. Oh, right, see. because we oh, had a lot I of see. problems back then that the traditional products didn't solve well. So lots of pain and, points. And we used we used everything. I mean, we had giant Oracle machines, Sunny ten thousands. We had <laughs> SQL Server and uh, MySQL clusters where we had done application level sharding ourselves. So we done all we we wrote our own key value distributed key value store ourselves, kind of like like a lot of the internet companies did yeah. over time yeah. because we had to. And then, and then after DoubleClick, uh, I, with others, started some other things like Business Insider and Gilt. And, and as we were doing these things, it was sort of like I've seen the same problems come up over and over. Got same it. technical problems. Got at it. At different organizations, you know, and each has their own CTO. Yeah. They're all facing the same challenges. Yeah. They're all doing what seems, looks to me like the same workarounds. Right. Now, it turns out those workarounds are best practice because everyone's doing them, you know, like <laughs> caching, for example. Yeah. You know, yeah. Caching isn't always a workaround. I know yeah. it, in a CPU chip, but it's not so, a workaround. No, it, isn't. it just makes a lot of, but, but, <laughs> but in extremis, you know, you can use it as a band-aid. And that sometimes it works great if you don't have any rights and then until all the cache servers reboot and yes. all the caches are empty. Uh, so, so that's just one example. Right. But you know, I see all this, it's like there's got to be a better way. So, Myself and my colleagues were talking about but, this, and, and that's how we began work on the project. But do you have like a fundamental death wish as well? Because you're going up against Oracle and Microsoft, I mean, two of the, the giants of this space. So, it must be like terrifying. That, or uh, do you love taking on these titans and turning them upside I down? I would be worried about that if it were not open source. Right. So right. because of that, right. that asymmetry of size is, is, is counteracted and offset. Got so it. that is really why it hasn't been a problem and why I don't think it will be a problem so much. I, I'm more worried about I, just all our other competitors. Sure. Of which uh, there are a number yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. And, and even though we're the most popular right now, uh, but, but, I, and, and, you know, that, but that would also give me some comfort. Right. And, and this would apply to a lot of the products in our yes. space that, you know, that the product's not going to disappear, you know, because you, you, you can't, it, it's hard to acquire it and bury it because it is open source. So, I mean, if you do that, I'll just, I'll just fork it. I'll create a new startup <laughs> that runs with that, uh, you, you know, yeah. uh, so, and also yeah. then from the other side, it's because it's open source, it's, it, it's not like, in, it's, I can't, I don't want to pay infinity for it because right. it's, right. I can't get that back. So I can later. fork it or I can knife the leaders and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get in there and have a go. Now, how did you get people to get behind you in databases? I mean, it's not exactly the sort of sexiest. I mean, you've made it sexy, but back then it wasn't. How did you persuade engineers to come over and, and do this? The developers like to try new things all the time. And that's one of the great things about open source is that it lets you try things. And, and it does. And you true. might try five things and discard four. Very true. And you might do that in two days if you wanted, right? So that's one of, the, I think, the power of open source is just I can very quickly do evaluations. I don't have to call a salesperson, set up a meeting. They come in. They give us a big PowerPoint, proof of concept. You know, it's just, well, that takes forever. Yes. Even if it worked, great, fine, but how do I evaluate things quickly? Yes. So I think so that's one of the things we're getting from open source. It's not about money per se. And what about scaling up? Because clearly you've got some massive growth going on right now. What have you learned from the past and what advice would you give to people out here if they're looking at startups that are going to scale very quickly in the enterprise space? In terms of organization? Yeah, organization, yeah. how do you get the right structures? What, what are you, three things, just pick three things. Um, yeah, well, you know, I think if, if, it, if you're a first-time entrepreneur, you can get a lot of good advice from, hopefully, from your investors. Yes. Right? I'm very if happy. you have good that. ones. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, yours. Uh, the <laughs> other thing is just focus on hiring and give it way more yeah. time and priority than your natural inclination. Right. Interview someone every day. Right. Have an in-house recruiter, even if they're, they can be contracts, yes. but they sit next to you. Right? It, 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 if, if you spend... People, Same people, amounts people, of time people. on recording, yeah. recruiting. Yeah, that's a that's probably number one. Got it. And I, I see you guys won an award for the, one of the best, most fun workplaces in the valley. So you have Nerf ball battles across the entire office and various other things. So you clearly sort of try and make the place fun to be in as well. We do. Um, it, it's interesting though, because I, I do think about 
culture a lot yeah. and what we want it to be. Because I remember back from DoubleClick, it, at one point we had a thousand people and I looked around and I thought about the culture and it was good. It was a good right. culture. But I didn't push it there. Yeah. It just landed there. So it was also then sort of in hindsight terrifying. <laughs> so, so this time around, you know, it's, it's been over the years, it's like a, you know, Got a constant trend tabbing of what do I think it should be? Yeah. What do I think it makes sure, if we're selling enterprise software, yeah. like for example, I want it to be a fun place. We want it to be a kind of a geeky, nerdy place. But the, it's, it's got to be a certain seriousness right. too because right. there's people counting on us yeah, and it's big, big for their mission critical big, systems. Absolutely. So it, it's, it's, it's a balance. Like, I, don't, I don't want lava lamps, got but, it. but I want it to be a fun place to work. And last question very quickly. You raised $80 million in January, I believe. Um, what's the future? I mean, are you going to be the company that stays independent, becomes Decca, Mega, Unicorn, whatever we're going to call it in three, four years' time? Or... Uh, IPO uh, or acquisition? Where, where, where are you going with all this? And what are you going to do with that money? Just in one minute. Uh, so yes to the first. Uh, so so <laughs> yes, you're going to uh, be massive. We're not like a unicorn. Excellent. We're not going to sell it. Okay. Uh, I stay want to, I wanted to stay independent and grow. Uh, so one Excellent. thing I would say about software Excellent. companies is they can get really big. Yes. Even open source, but it takes a while. Yeah. They don't get big instantly like a, a Facebook, right? So you got to let it go, and, 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 and that's, what we're, that's our plan. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, would you thank Dwight Merriman. Excellent session. Thank you.